Welcome to Taoist Secrets, The Great Awakening, a podcast by practicing disciples of Taoism at the Temple of Original Simplicity. This is Episode 6. Today, Master Richard Pococo, David Wright, and Peter Lafarge discuss the significance and cultivation of imagination, not only in the practice of meditation, but in our daily lives. Well, we were having a discussion earlier about the natures of imagination, the role of imagination, the fact that visualization revolves very heavily around imagination, that you are trying to go places you've never been, you're trying to see things you may have been told, all right, you want to go to your castle, but you're not being given any specifics about what your castle looks like. So it's up to your imagination to figure out, what does my castle look like? How big is it? How many rooms does it have? Uh, What color is it? Are there other things there? What kind of things are in it? We've been told only in the most general terms about, well, there's supposed to be an altar room, for example. Even beyond that, we haven't said that there's a wall or whether there isn't. Uh, how is it's very tall castle? Is it very large in area or relatively small? All of these things are things we have to fill in. And this goes back to a discussion we were having about creativity and the role of imagination and whether or not, say, modern culture tends to suppress creativity because something like video games give you too much detail and don't allow your own imagination to fill in the details. Your imagination is kind of like a muscle, and if it doesn't get exercised, it isn't going to work very well. Grandmaster Anatole, when he first began instructing us on meditation, he gave us a canon, but he didn't give us the very specific details of what things would look like intentionally, I believe, because it, it was for our imagination. He gave us, he planted the seeds in the fertile soil, and our imagination is what, whatever we experience in, in the meditation is what bloomed. Grandmaster Anatole explained to us years ago that imagination and visualization is the bridge that entices the great spirits to interact with you in meditation. So you need to visualize in your mind's eye some kind of canon of instructions that he explained to you, for instance, like the castle, as David said. And then in your mind's eye, you need to create some kind of very vivid image of that environment and interact with the spirits there. The Grand Master explained to us that in ancient China, the vehicle of Chinese theater was one of the main ways that people developed their imagination. And because there were almost no props in Chinese theater, there was quite a bit of symbolism for, for the imagination to work with. For instance, if someone stood on a table, it meant that they were riding a horse. And everyone in the audience understood that symbolism that someone standing on a table was riding a horse. Even the ability to visualize books that are being read. Today in modern society, the reading of, of uh, literature in the classics is, is way down. If you were to go to a bookstore and talk to the owner there, of which I did several years ago, a science fiction bookstore, He said to me, and they ended up going out of business very recently after I spoke to him about this, he said that he had almost no customers that were young people. And he told me that video games today were so explicit that there was no reason for kids to read stories and to visualize that power of the story itself to create some kind of personal rendition for them. Because the video games are so explicit, if you want to be a soldier, you get a video game of a soldier. If you want to be an astronaut, you get some video game of an astronaut. So there's no longer like the child creating some kind of costume or some kind of imaginary way to fill in those details. And the the development of your imagination is hooked to the creativity of things. It allows you to visualize and be creative about solution development within your life. And if you don't develop your imagination, it's almost impossible to imagine any place you've never been. And that is really the essence of meditation. If you can't visualize a dimension that's beyond three-dimensional 
understanding, then it's impossible to do the visualization itself or the meditation. And this isn't probably just a modern problem. I'm sure they had these problems in the past, but especially now where people are spoon fed their imagination, what to think and how to see it and how to visualize it. If someone is told to visualize a purple forest and they're the kind of person who they see a chair and they, they understand that's a chair, they can feel it and touch it and they close their eyes and they don't see a chair, well, the chair is not there. So how can they possibly visualize a purple forest if it's something that they have no context with? People, as Dave had alluded to earlier, the imagination is like a muscle and if you don't work that muscle, it, it will atrophy. And that the imagination is such a crucial aspect to the meditation as, as Master Bakoko had spelled out. One of the things that struck me is that children given free reign are, tend to be quite imaginative and they'll come up with all kinds of stuff. If you listen to them talking about uh, things, stories that they're making up and playing with each other, they can be very creative. So we all have the potential to do this and it's mostly a question of exercising it. When we're doing a guided visualization, that's not as spontaneous, it's not as free and We've mentioned this in the past that there's a certain amount of effort involved with doing it because you're trying to stay on a particular track and work with a particular set of images and the mind tends to be undisciplined and doesn't want to do that. I didn't want to leave people with the impression that when I say that this is effort or that it's work, that it's like back-breaking, uh, mind-wrenching work, that it's an effort in the same sense that maybe painting the living room is an effort or that mowing the lawn is an effort that you have to put some work into it, but it's not exhausting. It's just that it's focused work and you're working towards a particular goal and there's a certain amount of effort involved with that. It, I don't even know if I'd say it gets easier as time goes by. I think it gets, it may do, it, I think it does some from experience, but it gets richer that you're the you start to fill in more of the details. You will have more good days than bad days on your visualization, anybody can have a bad day. You get more out of it because you have more background and you've filled in some of these things in, from your past visits and that you already know, okay, the castle looks like this. I'm not seeing it for the first time. So now I, maybe I can go into a room I've never been in before or I can visit a particular place and see it in greater detail. It probably does to some degree get easier. If you're at work and you're having a, a lot of, you have a huge workload, at least from my experience being in the restaurant business, when it's very busy and you're running a tail off, the day may fly by quickly and it may have seemed not very difficult. It may have seemed effortless because you were so busy, but because you were doing it at a level of expertise that you've done so much, you were able to handle that. And the same thing with, with the meditation where you've done it so often for so many years that it is still work, it's focus, but it's not as much of an effort when you're first trying to, to focus and you have to command yourself constantly to focus. Eventually that comes. Well, an, an anecdote from the Grand Master. Um, at one point in his travels, he spoke to a Taoist monk from uh, another country. This monk's primary function, primary job, was visualization. He was supposed to spend a lot of time working on his visualization. And he confided to the Grand Master that he wasn't sure he was doing it well enough. He really wasn't sure. He hoped he was. And he, I think he felt that he was competent at it, but he just wasn't sure it was good enough. Was he really preparing himself for a transition to other dimensions after death, for example? And I thought, well, if that fellow can have his doubts, then I guess I can have mine too. The Grand Master has explained to us that every action has some kind of consequences in life. And it's important that when you choose a course of action, you use your imagination to try and imagine consequences that can happen. Because if, if you couldn't imagine potential sequences of consequences that can happen based on your actions, then there would be no way to check your action against reality to see potential pitfalls that could happen. So the better your, your imagination is, it helps you to imagine potential consequences that can happen in different situations and scenarios. And this is probably one of the main 
use cases for imagination in our life that we use on a daily basis. Whenever you choose a course of action, you have to visualize and imagine potential consequences and pitfalls that can happen. So that's a direct, very practical application of imagination in our lives. Indeed it is. And one of the other things he said that I think is extremely useful because philosophy is great, but it really needs to be useful, is that most people, when they try to imagine the consequences of their action, they only imagine positive consequences of their action, that they think, well, if I go to this place and I do this thing, I'll have this great outcome in my life, or at least nothing negative. They don't think about, well, what if it goes wrong? Um, you can get in your car and drive to the store and drive back, and 99 times out of 100, nothing odd will happen. But suppose you're driving on a really bad day. Well, what if you got a flat tire? Are you prepared for that? I don't mean that you have to live in fear of these things, but do you at least have an idea of what would you do if this happened? And it's another side of imagination that people don't want to exercise because it isn't fun thinking about negative things that happen. But the Grand Master really emphasizes that you have to think about those things, not because they're guaranteed to happen or even likely to happen, but you don't want to be caught completely flat-footed if they do. We've touched on this in the past about the worst-case scenario, and that is definitely something that the Grand Master has instilled upon us, and to constantly think about, not to be negative and uh, pessimistic, but to be realistic, definitely to be realistic, to see things clearly and accurately, but to use our imagination and spontaneity to handle these situations. If you are always thinking that it's going to be a sunny day, you'll never have your umbrella, you'll never have your winter coat on, you'll just go, to, go about your ways imagining that it's a beautiful sunny day when it's not in reality. In fact, one of the scenarios that often occurs to me is related to that, that if you're going out in your car in the winter time, take your warm coat. I don't care if you're only going a couple of miles because if your car breaks down and you have to walk, say, home, even if it's only a mile, if it's five degrees outside, you're going to be really sorry if you don't have your coat. And if you don't need it, well, tough. It, it wasn't that much effort to bring it with you. But the downside risk is so huge on this one. And it's interesting. It's not pessimistic to think about these situations I mean, the Boy Scouts, I mean, I wasn't a Boy Scout, but the Boy Scouts have this phrase that says, always be prepared, be prepared. And what does it mean to be prepared for situations? It means that you first have to imagine potential situations that could happen and then prepare for those situations. If you had no imagination about what could happen during the day, then you'd never have to prepare for anything. And when something spontaneously occurred, you wouldn't be ready to deal with that situation. So really imagining potential consequences and preparing alternate solutions for that is, is one of the main aspects of imagination that has a hook with reality. And even if situations happen that you're not prepared for, or you don't have an eventuality that you've built, it's still your ability to be creative in those situations and to use your imagination, even in real time, is something that you develop by looking at potential consequences. So this analysis of potential consequences is one of the most realistic philosophical reasons why the imagination is so important. Master Prococo has touched on something that's very important and it's one of the great powers of the Tao is that the Tao teaches principles doesn't teach recipes. It doesn't teach you what to do in the situation like a, like a martial arts uh, karate move 492 if someone attacks you with a knife from the left hand. It teaches principles and it's the student of the Tao that applies the principles to the situation adequately. This also goes back to one of some of our earlier discussions in the previous podcasts about if you're imagining or you're visualizing yourself in another dimension and you're encountering previously unseen scenarios, you're encountering things you never saw, you might encounter, exactly, you might encounter a dragon, you might encounter hostile people, you might encounter a monster, you might just, you might encounter a completely dark room. And this 
sort of thing fosters your creativity, your problem solving, and your ability to react to the unexpected. It's not a panacea. It doesn't mean that when a bad situation arises in your own life that you're automatically going to do the right thing. But at least you've had some practice dealing with the unexpected. And the unexpected isn't necessarily bad. It may just be odd or un- previously unexperienced. But say as you, if you're, but if you're inter- say you were suddenly introduced to a famous person. If you had never imagined being introduced to a famous person and it never occurred to you this could happen to you, there's a good chance you're just going to stand there dumbstruck. It would be nice if you at least thought about this sort of thing happening to you so you could at least say, hi, it's nice to meet you. A, A mundane example. But it's just a preparation for the unexpected because life is full of unexpected things. There's another very practical part of visualization that goes, originally this was defined as visualization in the martial arts, for instance, but it can really go with any discipline that someone is very adept at. So, for instance, say that someone was a very accomplished ballroom dancer. Now, if someone had no dancing experience at all, then visualizing themselves dancing is just some kind of ridiculous exercise because they don't have the physical capability to actually go through the dance. But yet if someone was a professional dancer, they can visualize in their mind's eye how that dance will go and the nuances of the dance and that will help them to perform. It's basically um, some kind of mental preparedness for the physical action. So sometimes visualization for very accomplished people, if you're a painter, you can visualize yourself painting, for instance, and and that will help when you actually go to do that. If you're a dancer, you can visualize yourself dancing and the routine that you need to go through. And this mental preparedness will help at the time when you actually have to do it. I've had situations like that, say, with to, to relate to an experience, most of us aren't professional dancers, but most of us, say, have driven a car. And if you can imagine, say, you're driving in the winter and suddenly you're in a very slippery, you're going down a hill, very slippery situation, your brakes really aren't working very well, and you can see that there's traffic stopped up ahead of you, what are you going to do? And what you might say is, you know what I'm going to do is I'm just going to go to the right and drive into the snowbank. Not very, I'm not going very fast, so I probably won't get hurt and I can probably get out of it again, but at least I won't smash into the car in front of me. And if you've thought about that, if you've even imagined what it would be like, it gives you a great advantage over being caught completely by surprise and smashing into the car in front of you. I'm not a big sports fan, but I do remember hearing a conversation, I believe it was on the radio, between two sports announcers, and they were talking about a player. I'm not sure if it was Larry Bird or if it was another player. And one of them made the point how he was was not very physically quick, on his feet, but that he was able to make the points, uh, as as many points, as another player who was very quick. And the point he made was that he knew where to be at the right time. So he wasn't physically able to get someplace, but because he knew where the right place to be was at the right time, like a chess player, he was able to get himself into that position and it gave the appearance that he was very quick where he wasn't physically very fast. And that has to do with imagination. If you didn't have the ability, the skill set to put yourself somewhere esoterically or, or uh, theoretically, then you wouldn't be able to, to think like that and to, to act like that. You're absolutely right, Pete. The ability to anticipate how a situation is going to go is exactly related to imagination and previous experiences. I mean, your um, your na- analogy with Larry Bird is a valid one because Larry Bird always seemed to be where he needed to be at the time, and yet he wasn't incredibly quick. He was actually kind of a big, slower player. But his ability to anticipate where the ball was going to go based on his imagination and experience was a huge advantage for him. It does, it does show the role of experience, though, that imagination is tempered by experience because it shows you both what can happen and what's likely to happen. That I'm prepared when I go out on the street to drive, 
that there's going to be people who do really dumb things. They, they don't signal, they stop short, they cut in front of you. And so I'm anticipating those things because of my experience of having driven that I know that these are commonplace occurrences. I don't expect the bridge to collapse in front of me as I approach it, not because it's impossible, but because it isn't very likely. And so that's not where I put most of my focus. I can only try to be prepared for so many things. There are degrees to which you could use your imagination to prepare for the worst case, and it can also lead you, if you allow it to, to a level of schizophrenia, where you are carrying a car full of, yeah, you become paranoid, you become, and that's, that's unrealistic and, and not an adequate reaction. If you're planning for a volcano and there's not a volcano where you live, then probably that's not the right uh, reaction. So uh, that's just an extreme example of, we are not known for planning as Taoists. Taoists doesn't plan, he lives in the moment. Don't confuse what we're saying with planning, we're preparing. Preparing is to have a mental state that something could happen, something usually unpleasant, but something could happen because it's beyond our control. A planner believes that they're in control or, or thinks that they control the circumstances or the outcome of the circumstances by having a checklist of things and, and knowing what to do. We don't know. We're not in control. But that's why we use our imagination to prepare ourselves for the unimaginable. Well, I was thinking of what you were saying there, that because the world is a large, complex place with many possible outcomes, that saying that, all right, I'm going to try to be prepared for X, Y, Z possible outcomes. One thing I've discovered, unfortunately, is that if I'm looking forward to a particular scenario or I'm looking forward to a particular situation that I know I'm going to be, like I have to go to this party tonight, and what's going to happen when I get there? Well, I can think up half a dozen things that might happen when I get there or what it's going to be like. Usually something else will happen. Usually something I didn't think of actually happens. But at least I'm prepared. I'm trying to be flexible enough to say, all right, I, there are a lot of situations that could arise. And at least I'm trying to be able to cope with them, whatever they are. If you are a planner, as um, I mean, the Grandmaster loves to talk about the futility of planning. That's one of his favorite phrases that it's basically talking about what I was saying there, that the world is going to outwit you. If you think you have it all figured out and you know exactly what's going to happen, you're almost certainly wrong. If you are so sure of yourself, then you really are going to be caught flat-footed because when what you expected doesn't happen, you will have no idea what to do. If you want to make the gods laugh, tell them your plans. That's a, it's been told in many different ways, but that's one of the Grandmaster's favorite, uh, favorite quotes. Grandmaster Anatole just uh, told us last week about this very interesting negative aspect of imagination, and we were talking about this after meditation on Tuesday evening. And he had said that, so just as background information, the form, the canon of the great Chinese Tao spirits, they look like human warriors. They're set like people. They have two arms, two legs. They have armor and the weapon. Assigning uh, human characteristics to the great spirits that really have no form is called anthropomorphism. And Master Anatole showcased this in the Fox book. And he had said that how for humans to relate to the great spirits that have no form, the Taoist canon was created to give those spirits human characteristics, basically these anthropomorphic characteristics. Grandmaster Anatole's fox spirit told him that this is actually a negative thing because now by assigning the great immortal spirits human characteristics, it gives the mortals some kind of wrong expectation of how they deal with us and what their role is. They're not human and they don't have human characteristics like we do. You shouldn't deal with them as they have human characteristics or if they're humans because they're not. So in a way, the lack of imagination and not being able to imagine the spirit as some kind of general force with no form has allowed this canon to exist. 
And then it gives people the wrong expectations that these immortal forces are, have actually some kind of human characteristics. Sometimes it makes us interact with the great immortal forces incorrectly because we think that they're, they're almost human. They have some kind of human characteristics. So I thought this was a very interesting example of how by constraining the imagination, it actually creates the wrong communication vehicles for these forces. Now, the canonical forms served multiple purposes that because most people are not all that imaginative, it gave them a concrete way to imagine the spirits, which in some ways is good, in some ways is bad. One of the other things about the canonical forms is that, as Master Pococo said, the spirits are, most of them anyway, wearing armor, and they're carrying weapons. The message to this part, because most of the Taoist attendees of these temples at that, a couple thousand years ago were illiterate, they had to work with images. And the image here was to remind you that even the spirits are armored, even the spirits are armed. Life is a war, life is a struggle. And so even the spirits weren't above this, that they were having to deal with it just as we do. So that part was useful. But yes, the constraint on the imagination is a significant factor. And in fact, one of the things we were discussing before uh, we started this podcast was when a book is turned into a movie, now you're seeing a particular person's vision of what the characters and the scenes in that book looked like. This can be quite a constraint on your own imagination that you try to think about it yourself or you try to think about it in a different way, you go back and read the book again. This affects your own perceptions. And sometimes it can be decidedly wrong if you're, for example, reading a book or watching a movie about a historical figure and they have someone playing this historical figure. The person playing the historical figure may look nothing like what the actual historical figure looked like. So then you come across, a, say, a contemporary picture of that person, and you think, oh, that person doesn't look like a Hollywood star at all. <laughs> and it can be rather disorienting. Conversely, the, the Shinto and the Bon people, the Shinto used rocks, which they would cover with just a cloth. And to them, that's the, that represented the spirits that they would pray to. So they didn't need the very intricate humanoid forms of the, the spirits, the gods. And the Bond people and, and the roots of shamanism would look at the sky and use that as a spirit. They, they, that was a representation of the blue sky spirit for them. Even the great celestial foxes, the proliferation of the uh, religion was very different in different cultures. The celestial foxes are very explicit in Japan, where they have a form of the actual male and female fox. And yet in ancient China, there was really no form for the celestial fox itself beyond Manchuria with the great Mr. and Mrs. Hu. And those weren't very public statues either. China took a different tactic to the manifestation of the canon of the great celestial foxes than Japan. Because they were very feared in China, they didn't want to have explicit images of the foxes or even talk about them because they felt that they could manifest in their lives. In certain cultures, the manifestation of the gods or spirits are different. Sometimes they have no form. Um, they're just a rock or, or the spirit of the wind or the spirit of the sun, something that's kind of autonomous without form. And yet in ancient China, they chose this anthropomorphism to kind of give the spirits, as, as Dave said, uh, form because a lot of the uh, Chinese peasants were illiterate. Even the Japanese form of the foxes, you know, it's, as you say, it's a canonical form. It's easily recognized. But if you were to put them right next to an actual fox, they don't look exactly like an actual fox. They're a particular representation of what a, a fox might look like. So everybody understands this. But it just shows you the separation that if you put a one of these little uh, porcelain fox figures, which you can find on eBay for a few bucks. And then you compare that to, what does a real fox look like? No, it doesn't look exactly like that. The Taoist 
sages, the ancient Taoist sages, had codified much of what the shamans were practicing before they had created this this idea of Taoism to give it a little bit more of a um, a little bit more of a structure, so that it could be taught to the masses, I guess, or to to certain people, not to the masses, but to certain people. Whereas the shamans, it was all very oral. Uh, it was an oral tradition that was passed down from one to another. They probably had very few icons the way we do. Well, in nomadic cultures, for example, they couldn't afford to. It's too heavy to carry around. It's only when you have a more urban culture that you can have a stationary temple where you have the opportunity to build statues and icons that are too large to be transported conveniently. It is interesting that a lot of the ancient Chinese art is Taoist art is related to the gods and spirits and other dimensions. Within the temple here we have a full set of the Yao temple. In reality it was like a traveling manifestation of the temple. These tree box scrolls of which there's maybe 30 could be packed up and moved and set up almost anywhere as like a traveling temple. As a lot of ethnic Chinese moved out of China with the Cultural Revolution with Mao Zedong, these temples that could move were actually pretty popular. And it's interesting that the gods in the ancestor worship came from these traveling temples. And they were very explicit about the canon of the spirits in the, the heavens and how they were arranged. The Taoist art itself documents a lot of the great spirits in these other dimensions. And that is a point of reference for us for our visualization and imagination. Another point is that that ties the meditation and imagination is Imagination is definitely a basis that you need in order to meditate and to achieve the visualization. But the meditation in itself also enhances the imagination. It, so it, it makes it real? It was an exchange. I mean, you, you need the imagination to meditate, but the meditation in itself... It's a feedback uh, loop. It's a feedback loop. Thank you very much. There's a feedback loop between the meditation and the imagination. The more you meditate the more your imagination becomes active and, and this active imagination is very good for you, not just from a creative aspect, but from a daily aspect, from a problem-solving aspect. So if, if you're a banker and you have situations that you need to come up with creative solutions for, this imagination that is active and fluid and dynamic will help you in your professional career. It'll help you in your personal situations, in your personal relationships. So this this exchange of being able to meditate and meditation enhancing your imagination is, is a important relationship. One of the things that's often struck me about meditation within the temple, especially the traveling meditations, is just the enormous variety of experiences that people describe from having been through this that Pete would probably be too modest to say so, but his are some of the most interesting of the ones that we have, and it's partly just because they're so varied that I feel as though my own are rather mundane a lot of the time or that I, they tend to be rather similar week to week. Some people, that's not their experience at all. I think we all have unusual ones from time to time, and I certainly have too. But the degree of imagination that's displayed is I've had meditations that one of the, th the indications to me that we really are interacting with spirits is that the variety of meditative experiences goes beyond what I think my own rather limited imagination would come up with. And yet it's a very interesting aspect what both of you guys are talking about. I mean, since you can't really plan what happens in the meditation, and it is some kind of spontaneous environment that you're interacting in, but yet your visualization has to fill in the holes for these spontaneous events that happen. And sometimes it's something that you could never predict. It's not like you're... And, and I think Dave had talked about this very old monk that had been visualizing his whole life. And really, the, the essence of that was that he was saying, am I creating this in my head, or am I physically visualizing what's happening in the other dimension? And really, I'm not sure if there's a difference between those two things. 
you give the other dimension form somehow through your imaginative experience. But yet the spontaneity and the things that happen there, you could never ever predict or plan for, as Dave said, because you're, you have no experience with those things and your, your imagination is not vivid enough. And yet when something happens, your imagination needs to give that experience form. So that's this development of the imagination and the spontaneity of the imagination, which just is part of the whole aspect of meditation. Things happen that you could never ever plan, and yet you do experience those things as reality in these other dimensions. We've talked about the spontaneity of it before, that you may decide or you may think before you go into a meditation session that, well, there's this thing that's bothered me and I'd, that's what I'd like to focus on tonight or I was thinking I'd like to go back to this place and deal with this spirit. And sometimes you probably will. But sometimes you're going to wind up doing something completely different that has no connection with what you thought you might be doing on that session. And that's the spontaneity, that's the... That's the ability to deal with the unexpected and to cope with the unexpected. And that's again, comes back to this whole question of imagination and its role in everyday life to deal with unexpected situations. And life is rife with unexpected situations. Some of my best experiences in life have been the most spontaneous experiences where you run into a friend or something just happens that is not planned and it's usually a lot more interesting because it's just happening in the moment. There's a certain chemistry and a certain dynamic factor that's at play that, that no one could possibly have created intentionally. I mean, really, spontaneity has no expectation. So because you're not sure what to expect in the situation because it's totally spontaneous, a lot of times those are the most powerful experiences or the most pleasurable because you really had a nice time but you didn't expect that you were. Or sometimes you have the wrong expectation. You go to a movie and you think you're not going to like it, for instance, or a performance. You think that it's not really for you or the, the essence of this isn't interesting to you. And then you're pleasantly surprised by the spontaneity of the experience and it's actually a very, you know, enriching. I've had gone on dates where we would decided we were going to go to dinner, but we hadn't decided where we were going to go. And you're wandering around, and then you find a restaurant, you don't know anything about it, you go in it, it turns out to be a great place. And there's cases where spontaneity is nice. It's not the car breaking down, it's not that you get sick, it's that something good and enjoyable happens, and you want to be in an emotional state where you can allow yourself to enjoy that fact. Years ago, I was with my wife and we went to a movie and we actually purchased tickets for this one movie and somehow we went into the wrong movie. And then when we got into the movie, we started to watch it and realized it wasn't the right movie. But actually, we liked that movie better than the movie that we had paid to see. So sometimes spontaneity just happens. You're in the wrong place at the wrong time and you just you have a really good time. Other times, like Dave said, spontaneity, you lose your transmission on the highway when you're driving, you know, those things aren't great. Spontaneity can go both ways, but adaptation goes with the ability to deal with spontaneous things, whether they're negative or positive for subjectively to you. So your imagination helps you to deal with, un with the unknown, and that's part of the preparation that we go through as Taoist people. In fact, I was thinking about this just now when you mentioned that going into the wrong movie, that the real planners, the people who have, a, say they're going out on a date and they have it really planned about, okay, we're going to do this, 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 in this order, and it'll be at about this time. And something happens and you can't do that. Maybe the movie turns out to be canceled because the theater lost power, something like that. Now, if you're a real planner who insists on sticking to your plan, whether it makes sense now or not, you're probably going to have a lousy time because you didn't get to do what, things the way you wanted to do them. If you can roll with it and be spontaneous, you've now given yourself the permission and the opportunity to do something else that you didn't plan but might turn out to be really good. This is a honest to God, real life practical application of adaptation to be able to say, all right, Life has just hand, thrown me a curve, and it's something I wasn't expecting. It maybe wasn't the way I wanted it to go, 
but it doesn't mean it has to be a lousy day. And that comes back to expectations as well. It does indeed, because expectations are what set up the, the idea that I can plan everything and it's going to go just like I thought. Oh, sometimes it does. A lot of times it doesn't. What's also very interesting about spontaneity and adaptation is a lot of times you'll experience some kind of situation or event that's incredible for you and it's totally spontaneous. And then a second time you try to recreate that spontaneity and do the exact same thing again and it just doesn't have that power and experience the way it was the first time. You can't plan for spontaneity and you can't adapt to some kind of situation that you already know. Having the imagination and the ability to deal with spontaneity in its positive or negative forms is something that you really can't plan for. So you have to constantly use your imagination in life and it has to just be part of your normal operations and thoughts in order to deal with situations that arise. Seize the moment and take advantage of that great spontaneity, whether you need to adapt and deal with some kind of spontaneous problem that arises. And you can't plan for that spontaneous situation, but you can, if you're a creative person, you can help create that fertile ground so that you can be spontaneous. You can look at things from different perspectives. You can look at other people's works if you're an artist. I took a writing course once and I came home late from work. It was about 2 a.m. in the morning and I looked online to what the instructions were and it was given four scenarios that you were supposed to connect and it was a shoebox in a closet, two people dancing in a, in a fountain, headlights pulling into the driveway and then some other thing too. So I'm reading this at 2 o'clock in the morning and I'm thinking to myself, oh my God, she wants us to take these four scenarios and create a story out of it? So of course I stayed up for the next four hours writing an outline for the story that connected all these four things. And then I went to bed and I woke up the next morning and I was rereading and I reread her instructions and I realized that she said take one of these scenarios. So I, I read it obviously wrong, but I liked what I had created. I, I liked this bizarre story that, that meshed all these different things together and it was this spontaneous Ground. Spontaneity and flexibility go together. That uh, one of the grandmasters' favorite sayings is the things that are flexible are alive. Something that is rigid is dead. Uh, that uh, a very rigid tree is just going to be blown over by the first storm that comes by. A young, flexible tree will just bend with the wind and be able to survive it and continue its existence. All of these things come to the same thing that flexibility adaptation, all of this allows us to function in life because life is unpredictable. And without this kind of flexibility, without imagination to be able to say, hey, I can deal with these odd things that happen to me, these unexpected things that get thrown my way, I'm going to be a pretty unhappy person. I'm, I'm, Things are constantly not going to be going the way I want them to go. And all I'm going to do is crab about how things aren't going the way I want them to go. Well, the world doesn't really care whether things are going the way you, you want them to go or not. And you can either make yourself miserable by complaining about it, or you can try to figure out how to work within it and surf these waves that come your way. Imagination is also very spontaneous. If you read a book several times and it was one of your favorite books, and then as we said, a movie is made from this book, most times the visualization of this character, the movie itself, how the director views this character, is not exactly the way that you do. And something is lost in this physical translation of this book that you had read. The spontaneity of your imagination creates something that's very personal and powerful for you. And it just can't be captured in a movie form. Similarly, it's, it's an interesting example that if you were to see the movie first, and, then, and you'd never read the book, and then you go to read the book, this, this form that's, that, that's burned into your, into your mind from seeing this movie actually constrains your imagination. It's hard for you to think of that character other than you've seen him after that. So sometimes your imagination, in a way, can get poisoned by giving this form 
uh, you know, already some kind of concrete form that you experience, then you can't think of this character or story in any other way other than the way that you've explicitly seen it. So imagination can kind of go both ways with the spontaneity. Matter of fact, the, the, we do seem to keep coming back to the, say, the book versus the movie version of things, but it shows the, the differences and the limitations of these forms because a book almost invariably has far more detail, far more events, far more dialogue than you could ever cram into a two or three hour movie. So it means that whoever chose to do a visual adaptation of this book has to be very selective, has to really pick and choose which parts of it are important and which ones aren't. And the parts that they pick are not necessarily the parts that you really seize on and the parts that really matter to you. And they may leave out something that you thought was really important, or they may do it in a completely different way from the way you read it. And it does, yeah, you know, the, the lack of imagination can poison the experience or can certainly warp it in ways that is just unpleasant for you. Well, your planning for how your day is going to go is probably going to be impacted by the fact that it didn't go the way you thought it was going to. And you try not to let that poison it for you. It may, it may spoil the day to a certain degree. You may have been really looking forward to something that doesn't happen. But letting that ruin your day, that's pretty much up to you. It is ironic that you have us Taoist men speaking about imagination, seeing as Taoism is very concrete and we deal with reality and we deal with what we can see, what we can hear, what we can touch. And yet it is a very important element for us, this imagination. We talk about the Taoism does indeed deal with the concrete. We deal with the manifestations of the Tao since we can't see the underlying system. But I think the other side of that is recognizing that there is this gigantic system that we can't see and recognizing our own smallness and our own limitations and saying, what I can see is such a tiny sliver of what's really going on and what I can cope with. So, of course, I'm going to be constantly surprised that suppose that I saw a definition of coincidence was is that you weren't paying attention to the other half of what was going on. And that it, but life is so large and the world is so large and the Tao is so large that you can't possibly be paying attention to everything else that's going on. So you have no choice but to either be constantly slammed by the unexpected or to say, all right, the unexpected is coming, what am I going to do about it? And without imagination, you couldn't possibly comprehend that there's this great Tao, this great mechanism that's beyond your ability to even imagine, that it could even exist because you need imagination to even conceive of that. You talked about the person who sees a chair, if they're looking at it, they close their eyes, they can't even visualize the chair. And I think there probably are people like that. But to limit yourself to the concrete thing right in front of you as saying that's all there is, is incredibly limiting. And it doesn't recognize the fact that there's all these things going on around you that you can't see. And probably a good detective has a great imagination too, even though they deal with the hard facts. If someone is trying to deceive you, and what you see is what you see, but if you're a good detective, you have an imagination and you're saying, there's something more than what I'm just seeing here, there's something behind that mask, then you're able to get to the heart of the truth. And being able to observe what is really happening is a critical skill as well, because I think it was Feynman who said that the easiest person to fool is yourself. If you think that you know what's going on, if you think you know how things work, it will warp your perceptions because you'll try to change what you see to make it fit your preconceptions of how the world works and how things work. And you aren't that smart. You don't really know how things work. The point of this is that both imagination and adaptation are uh, living things that you can't plan for. But they're skills that need to be developed in life in order for you to be able to deal with the unexpected. And that's really how you maintain your composure no matter what happens, how you survive in both situations that are very good and very bad. Uh, it's how you level those things together and survive by developing the 
ability to visualize what could happen and the ability to have the imagination to adapt, to deal with things that are spontaneous and unpredictable. Well, I think adapting to the bad is the key point there, though, because it's easy enough to adapt to good situations. Nobody really has a lot of trouble with that. But it's when the bad situations come along, when the tight situations or the dangerous ones come along, that that's where the imagination and the flexibility can make a huge difference, can save your life. And sometimes even situations that are really good, people ruin those situations because they don't match their expectation of what they thought was going to happen. So even though this is incredibly pleasurable, it doesn't match their plan. And that's the problem with plans. Sometimes you can miss some great opportunity that spontaneously occurs in front of you because it doesn't match your plan. And, and it's a very real phenomenon that we have to be very careful of. This, these plans, Grandmaster Anatole explained to me years ago that there is no planning, there's only the general direction. So you need to define a general direction and then you need to move on that path in that direction, but you need to be ready to change this direction left or right, sometimes a one foot or two feet, sometimes totally change a direction if it's incorrect and it's not matching what's happening in reality. So there is no stringent plan that doesn't change in real time based upon adaptation. Now, the futility of planning doesn't mean you shouldn't have goals. It shouldn't, doesn't mean that you shouldn't have things that you need or things that you want or that you're trying to figure out how to get. It just says that you cannot be planning the exact details of how all of it's going to go because you're going to be wrong. Thank you once again for joining us on our podcast. Please join us for our next episode as we continue our discussion on imagination. If you wish to learn more about Grandmaster Ali Sanatole, classical Taoism, and the Temple of Original Simplicity, please visit Tao.org. That's T-A-O dot O-R-G. You can also visit our Facebook page at the Center of Traditional Taoist Studies. Thank you.